Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Will Lawson. I'm a sophomore Lyceum Scholar, and it is my pleasure to introduce my friend, Ms. Elise Bloom, for her Lyceum Student Speaker Series talk. Ms. Bloom's talk is entitled, it is entitled A Man at Peace, Seneca on Constantine, and is based on a paper she wrote her freshman year, Wisdom of the Ancients Lyceum Seminar. Ms. Bloom will discuss Seneca's example of Constantine, the philosopher Stilpo, and the, and the role that wisdom plays in his enduring of turmoil. She will then compare this illustration to Shakespeare's Hamlet and how he dealt with comparable extreme circumstances. On a personal note, I'm excited for Ms. Bloom's talk because I remember how frustrated she was when we read Seneca for the first time last year. After numerous rants during lunches and a three-hour joint office hour session with Dr. Hoffauer, it was clear to me that this writing ignited a passion in Ms. Bloom's mind. And I was excited to hear that she was returning to this work for her talk today. Ms. Bloom is from Davidson, North Carolina, and is a sophomore industrial engineering major. In addition to being a Lyceum Scholar, she plays violin for the Clemson University Symphony Orchestra and is an editor for a student-run research journal, the Orantiago. At the close of Ms. Bloom's discussion, there will be a brief question and answer session. We ask that you please stand and introduce yourself before beginning your question. And now, please join me in welcoming my friend, Ms. Lise Bloom. Thank you all. I am so grateful for the community of peers and professors that I have been given by the Lyceum program. Thank you to those who have created this avenue, the speaker series, for us to present our work in a formal setting. I would particularly like to thank Dr. Hoffpower for his encouragement and assistance in my preparation. On the Constancy of the Wise Person contains Seneca's teaching about being unaffected by hardship. Seneca, a Roman Stoic, praises the wise man for maintaining his virtue and well-being amidst the tumult of life. The wise man is so grounded in himself that he receives neither injury nor insult. Seneca includes a most dramatic example of constancy, the philosopher Stilpo, whose city was stormed and whose life was, by all typical standards, ruined. Nevertheless, Stilpo was seemingly unmoved by these calamities. Stilpo is even more striking when contrasted to a character from literature, Hamlet. Hamlet serves as a foil to Stilpo, for Hamlet was pummeled by afflictions and found himself unable to maintain rational serenity. This talk will examine constancy, as illustrated by Stilpo's endurance and Hamlet's turmoil. Stilpo was dealt a hard lot. His city was conquered by Polyorcates, who made himself king. Stilpo went, underwent interrogation by Polyorcates and the humiliation of being lower than his enemies. Furthermore, he describes himself as being old and alone, for his daughters were seized and he knew not what they were facing. When his city was captured, he lost every external good he possessed. His property was seized, his land ravaged, his house burnt down. Every material item to his name was gone. Personally, he suffered great injury. In Seneca's account of the events, Stilpo says, just now I crawled out from the ruins of my house and with fires blazing all around me, I fled the flames through a trail of blood. Not only did he lose his wealth and belongings, but he lost his family and country. One could scarcely choose worse circumstances to face. Yet, according to Seneca, Stilpo recounts his tale indifferently. A striking theme in Seneca's narrative is Stilpo's claim that he has lost nothing. When recounting his misfortunes, Stilpo's attitude is stunning. He says, all my things are with me. They will be with me. Stilpo's reasoning is that his only true possession is his mind. For he had with him his real goods, which none can lay claim to, whereas those things that had been snatched away and scattered around and were being passed from hand to hand, he judged to be not his, but rather things that come and go at fortune's beck and call. By viewing material possessions as being on loan, Stilpo detaches his well-being from their fate and remains immovable. Since Stilpo still has his reason, he says, all my things are with me. This claim is entirely counter to a common understanding of possessions. The very word possessions implies ownership of material goods. If a person loses that which is his, he will be shaken. A normal person would be devastated by the loss that Stilpo endures. Traumatic events and losing close family members drive some people to suicide. Yet Stilpo rises above such a drastic reaction. By viewing his possessions as being on loan, Stilpo could not lose those possessions when they were taken from them. He is nearly unaffected by his loss, for he does not consider it to be a loss. Seneca does qualify this detachment from material goods by saying that Stilpo had enjoyed those things stolen from him, but not as his own, because the possession of things that flow in from outside is slippery and uncertain. Seneca indicates that Stilpo chose to treat his material goods as being on loan because he could not be sure of his permanent enjoyment of them. 
Do his goods truly not belong to him? Or did he emotionally detach from his goods as a coping mechanism in the wake of disaster? Stilpo reasons that he can bear hardships calmly and favorable conditions moderately, remaining constant in his character regardless of his circumstances. A person cannot control whether fortune will bring material blessing or hardship. Silpo sums up his philosophy of ownership, saying that a constant person can think nothing to be his except himself, and even himself only in that part in which he is better, namely reason. A constant person views his only possession to be reason. His identity is found in wisdom alone. Accordingly, he is unharmed when he undergoes calamity. Beyond suffering the loss of material possessions and family members, Stilpo undergoes the conquest of his country by enemies. In juxtaposition with his city's violent destruction, amid swords clashing everywhere and the tumult of soldiers pillaging, amid the flames and blood and carnage of an overthrown city, amidst the temp crash of temples falling down on their gods, one man was at peace. Stilpo stole the triumph of his enemies, the triumph of superiority that is sought by all who endure an insult. Seneca writes, Stilpo wrested Polyorcates' victory from him by testifying that although his city had been captured, he was not only unconquered, but actually unscathed. The wise man's constancy makes him tough, unable to be truly defeated. Stilpo's detachment from his material goods is advantageous because it enables him to manage hardship. Nevertheless, his viewpoint is more startling when applied to his relationship with his daughters. Describing the sacking of his city, Stilpo says, as for the fate my daughters met, whether it was worse than our public fate, I do, not I do not know. Old and alone, and seeing only enemies all around me, I nevertheless declare that my assets are intact and unharmed. Whatever I had that was mine, I have and told. He calls them his daughters, and he refers to his people's fate, yet he says that his assets are unscathed. There must be multiple ways in which something can belong to a person. Though Stilpo's daughters are his by way of fathering him, ultimately, the only thing that belongs to Stilpo is himself. Accordingly, his account betrays no emotion regarding his daughter's suffering. He enjoyed them while they were part of his life, but now that they are gone, he will continue without turmoil as a complete person in possession of everything he owns. This hardness of spirit is certainly useful, but it denies emotional attachment to one's own family, which is arguably a fundamental aspect of humanity. Seneca's account of constancy suggests that there is no appropriate emotion of sorrow, no place for love, Stilpo should consider the fate of his daughters, and it should bring him to a place of reasonable sorrow. Such sorrow would care enough to protect his daughters, seeking their good to the furthest extent possible. Seneca diminishes love by his esteem for constancy in the tale of Stilpo. Viewing reason as supremely good, Stilpo forsakes care for others so that he may preserve his state of mind. Not only was Stilpo's country devastated, but Seneca explicitly states that the gods, which ought to have been worshipped, were crushed. Presumably, if one's country and gods are good, then there would be an appropriate anger at their destruction. But Stilpo is at peace. If one's country and gods are not good, then what is good? One's mental serenity? Seneca praises the peace of Stilpo because it is the result of his wisdom and constancy. Even though Stilpo's city had been captured, he was not only unconquered, but actually unscathed. Stilpo's constancy enables him to remain calm. Yet that same quality prevents him from taking part in the fighting. Thus, constancy seems to undermine any motivation to fight in defense of one's family and city. When Seneca says that those things that have been snatched away and scattered around, he judges to be not his, but rather things that come and go at fortune's beck and call, his country must be included. Seneca admires devotion to one's country, yet he praises Stilpo, who was unfazed by the destruction of his country. For Seneca, everything aims at constancy. Accordingly, there is no righteous anger on behalf of one's family and country. While constancy is technically only a part of virtue, it seems to eradicate all other loyalties. The wise man overcomes his enemies by his impenetrable walls of virtue. Seneca uses the caricature of Stilpo to teach a lesson. Highlighting Stilpo's age, Seneca appeals to the wisdom that old age, years of reflection, ought to bring. An old man, Stilpo's death was imminent. Regardless of conquering enemies, he would soon leave behind material possessions and close family members. Thus, with the perspective of old age, he has developed apathy toward those possessions and people. By contrast, other people in Stilpo City are controlled by love of money, paralyzed by material losses, and they flee from the enemy with their pockets weighed down. The constant man stands out from the hordes of people whose priorities are misaligned, which makes them weak. 
Perhaps Seneca overdramatizes Stilpo to emphasize the benefits of constancy. Stilpo says, just now I crawled out from the ruins of my house, and with fires blazing all around me, I fled the flames through a trail of blood. Yet he unemotionally reports his reaction to this vivid drama, supposedly conveying his immediate disposition toward hardship and suffering. According to his own words, Stilpo was not humiliated. His masters did not change. He lost nothing. He was unconquered and unscathed. He was at peace because he had a well-founded mind. Stilpo's constancy, a direct result of wisdom, made him unconquerable. Seneca commands his audience to consider whether a thief, a defamer, an insolent neighbor, or some wealthy man lording it like a king over Stilpo's destitute old age could do an injury to this man when war could wrest nothing from him. Stilpo's welfare seems to be completely impenetrable. His staunch character is all the more apparent when contrasted to the mental state of other people. Seneca's virtue of constancy enables men to cope with what Shakespeare calls the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. This line from Shakespeare's Hamlet alludes to an overarching theme of that play, for Hamlet found himself in dire need of withstanding misfortune. In the opening act of the play, Hamlet is introduced just after his father, the king of Denmark, has died. Though Hamlet was the rightful heir to his father, his uncle Claudius has usurped the throne. The ghost of Hamlet's father appears to Hamlet, revealing that Claudius murdered Hamlet's father. Furthermore, Claudius is sleeping with Hamlet's mother, Gertrude. After confirming the treachery of Claudius, the ghost implores Hamlet to revenge his father's murder and humiliation. Hamlet pursues vengeance against his uncle as tragedy enfolds everyone in the court. Hamlet faces a splintered state and family life. His uncle Claudius is responsible for deposing Denmark's ruler and destroying Hamlet's family. Claudius banishes Hamlet to England for a time with the intention of having Hamlet killed there. Hamlet has no home, no security. Overwhelmed by the treachery of his uncle, Hamlet contemplates suicide as a means of escape. He ponders whether he ought to, take, whether he ought to continue suffering hardship in life or end his suffering by death, take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing in them. Hamlet views life and trouble as being inextricably intertwined. He seeks relief from a weary life, but the dread of something after death stays his hand. Chronicling the wrongs people suffer in life, Hamlet says that the thing keeping people from escaping their troubles by suicide is the dread of something after death. He equates this dread with conscience, yet he seems to wish that he was strong enough to seize the path of action and of death. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought. And enterprises of great pitch and moment with this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Fear prevents Hamlet from escaping the hardships of life through suicide. The way he frames his decision, action or passivity, suicide or suffering, reveals his fragility. Bound by the intrigue and fear which surround him, Hamlet reveals that he is a slave to fortune. Framed by chaos, virtue has an element of constancy, according to Shakespeare. Speaking as Hamlet's father, the ghost recalls, my love for Gertrude was of that dignity that it went hand in hand with the vow I made to her in marriage. He references the vow of marriage, which exists to ensure permanence. By contrast, Gertrude's affection faltered and turned toward a man of lesser character, Claudius. When the ghost narrates the relationship between Claudius and Hamlet's mother Gertrude, he describes Gertrude as only a most seeming virtuous queen. If Gertrude's love was truly virtuous, she would not have returned the lust of Claudius. She would have stayed true to her husband, who was murdered by Claudius. The ghost even says that virtue will never be moved, though lewdness court it in a shape of heaven. By joining herself to Claudius, Gertrude reveals that her love was never true. While Shakespeare portrays true love as constant, nevertheless, love entangles people. Throughout the play, revenge and love are intertwined. The ghost urges Hamlet to get revenge on, his, on Claudius if Hamlet ever loved his father. Hamlet feels obligated to avenge his father and to end the evil Claudius is perpetuating. He says, is it not perfect conscience to quit him with this arm? And is it not to be damned to let this canker of our nature come in further evil? Hamlet and Claudius are both determined to kill each other, though they have different motives. Hamlet is burdened by the quest of avenging his father, while Claudius considers Hamlet to be a threat to his rule. Just as Seneca says that all those who injure and insult are trying to attain superiority, Claudius aims to kill, kill Hamlet because he feels threatened by Hamlet. Thus, Claudius' goal of murder reveals his weakness. Ultimately, Claudius challenges Hamlet to a duel with Laertes, one of Claudius' courtiers. 
Before the fight, Hamlet expresses concern over the possibility of, di of dying. Nevertheless, he calmly recognizes that eventual death is inevitable. Laertes brings a poisoned sword to the duel, and in the case that Hamlet is not killed by Laertes' sword, Claudius has prepared a poisoned drink for Hamlet. During the fight, Laertes and Hamlet swap swords, and both men are stabbed by the poisoned blade. The poisoned drink intended for Hamlet is drunk by Gertrude, Hamlet's mother. Hamlet does kill his uncle after first being wounded himself. As he lies dying, he expresses relief for his struggle being over. He refers to life as this harsh world and to death as felicity. The tragic ending to this play reveals that Hamlet had been swept along in the violence and suspicion of the whole court. Hamlet did not rise above the actions of Claudius. He responded in kind, inescapably involved in the pattern of death, as Shakespeare scholar Derek Traversi writes. Hamlet kills Claudius, but dies in the process. Hamlet's death seems inevitable, given his struggle in life. Though Hamlet seeks to act honorably and remain loyal to his father, he seems to be at the mercy of his tragic circumstances. He nearly succumbs to madness and ultimately dies in his quest for revenge. In his suffering, there are several parallels to themes in On Constancy, including revenge and misfortune. Hamlet was entangled in anger and revenge. Seneca asserts that the wise person will not seek revenge, for doing so would elevate the one who attempted injury to an equal level. The wise person is so far above those who seek to gain by injury and insult that the wise person has no need to respond to them. Seneca does allow for revenge, but only as a means of correction, not as personal vengeance. Hamlet's revenge was primarily driven by love and anger, which were notably lacking in Stilpo. Thus, Shakespeare and Seneca, through opposite examples, reveal that love for others entangles people's heart. Love makes one vulnerable to the injuries that others experience. This same love can drive quests of revenge. By contrast, when constancy is held as a supreme objective, it necessarily undermines loyalty to other things, like life, family, and country. Stilpo appears entirely unconcerned with the fate of his city and daughters, though righteous anger seems fitting. Rather than being an example to be emulated, Stilpo serves as a response to people who think that constancy is too high a goal for which to strive. Because Stilpo is extreme, he counteracts the protest that constancy is too hard. He lost everything imaginable, yet remained constant. Seneca anticipates possible objections from his audience with the analogy of climbing a mountain. But the way we are being called to is steep and rough. Seneca responds, well, can the heights be reached by a flat path? Yet the way is not even as steep as some people seem to think. Seneca argues that people have agency to control their state of mind. They can choose to have peace and to be free from anxiety. Those of superior moral character will be resilient in the face of adversity. They will not get caught up in the actions, much less opinions, of others. A person who injures or insults others is trying to elevate himself by damaging them. Seneca acknowledges that even the wise person will feel harsh injury, but since insult is something less than injury, the wise person does not register insults, or he thinks they are laughable. Being magnanimous, the wise man gives no weight to the opinions of others. Seneca condemns those who differ from children only in the size and shape of their bodies, but otherwise are no less misguided and astray, seeking after pleasures indiscriminately, anxiously, and peaceful only from terror and not from good character. People with weak minds are characterized by anxiety. They look for their circumstances to supply their mental welfare. By contrast, the wise person is not able to lose anything. He has everything placed in himself, he places no trust in virtue, and he has his goods on solid ground, being content with virtue, which does not have need of fortuitous things and therefore cannot be increased or diminished. The wise person is founded upon himself, so he depends on neither fortune nor the opinions of others. He is not disrespected by anyone. He knows his own greatness and he informs himself that no one has that much power over him. The wise person's high opinion of himself renders verbal assaults powerless. Seneca baldly states, although all men are different from one another, the wise person regards them all as equal on account of their equal stupidity. <laughs> Key to the wise man's resilience is the fact that he does not give the insulter the reaction he seeks. It is a kind of revenge to snatch away the pleasures of having made an insult from the one who made it. The barbs of insults are neutralized because the wise man regards them as nothing. Thus, he thwarts the insulter from the twisted triumph of making another suffer. It is a rare and valuable thing to be able to cope reasonably with difficult circumstances, which are inevitable. Seneca contends that it is possible to rise above the raging seas of this life. The wise man is untouched by insults and injuries. He has made himself into the sole source of his joys, 
and he separated himself from external things so that he does not live an unsettled life. He always acts rationally and is free from anxiety, for he has a perfectly composed mind. Seneca writes that fortune defeats us unless our defeat of it is total. Against the wise man, fortune has no power at all. Hamlet was unable to defeat fortune, so in Seneca's view, fortune defeated him. The deception seeping through the court led to Hamlet battling against himself and suspecting those around him. By contrast, Stilpo serves as an amplified standard of the security that constancy brings. The wise man's constancy enables him to maintain virtue and peace, unhindered by the whims of fortune. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions that people have. Yes, Sergio. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Sergio. Uh, I'm a senior, and I really enjoyed your talk. And I had a question regarding um, that last statement you made about the wise men being able to rise above like, the women of fortune. Um, couldn't you say that Hamlet's biggest problem was that he thought too much, and that like, in comparison to someone like Laertes, he wasn't able to take action and kill Claudius um, earlier? in the play, so that, that, that he's too divided or has too much internal monologue with himself. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And I think that is another aspect of Hamlet's suffering and turmoil is that he is not able to choose to like take action and end his troubles. Um, but I do think there is also an element of, it's hard to imagine how him just decide, I don't think that if he just decided to act sooner, then he would have been constant. Because he is, like it's just a part of his character that he's really unsure of how to act. And there is also the whole element of his motives behind revenge. And it seems like he isn't always quite sure of why he's doing what he's doing. And so, as you point out, like the line of like rising above and being able to evaluate one's circumstances and see the truth and not really care what happens to you, um, I think that's the distinguishing mark that would um, prevent Hamlet from being considered constant. Go ahead. Hi, Elise. Well, awesome. Oh, I this, and this question might, might um, push a little too, too far and lean too broad, but it stood out to me and, and when you're concluding, when you talked about how the, the constant man is, this, is like the sole purpose of his joys. And I'm, I'm wondering where you think that, that joy comes from. And this kind of pushes into more of like, do you think that this constancy is even like good or, or like ideal in the first place? Because, because and you, you kind of hint at it that it's kind of taking away parts of the human experience so it's like, if this person is so constant and steady and perfect formulation of mind, and he can't experience any of the bad, how is he then able to experience like these joys and goods and, and high life? I, I would agree with what you're saying. This is part of why I was frustrated by Seneca when I read him, as comes through a little bit, I think. <laughs> but I do think even that like the wise man is the sole source of his joys, and to me, it does seem like if you're always perfectly fine at 100%, like there's never, if you don't have the highs and lows, then you don't have the same sort of, like it's hard to imagine the constant person being elated. Um, so I do think that the it seems like the wise man is just content to not be there and that's sufficient for him. And he doesn't depend on the highs of something amazing happening to him because he doesn't depend on his circumstances for her well-being. But I do think that there is an element of the joy that we think of as like surprise or excitement that is just counter to his formulation. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Or not, 
Um, Seneca actually at the end of On Constancy talks, he kind of addresses people who are striving to get there and versus the person who's already made it. And even in that, se in that section, he seems to kind of, like his picture of the wise person who already has all his walls up and so he doesn't need anything seems a little unrealistic. And so it does seem like Seneca sees a place for there to be moderation in it. And he talks a lot about insult. He spends kind of the second half on insult. And um, I focus more on the first half with Stilpo. But when he's talking about that, I think that's where you see a clear application of constancy and moderation, where people are being insulted. Um, like political opponents are trying to tear each other down. And you can react by getting really mad about it and kind of showing that their words have that much power over you or you can rise above it and you can say i don't really care what they think because i already know my like i'm acting rightly i have virtue i'm content with that and so i don't need their validation or their criticism because it's irrelevant yes uh, so, I was wondering about um, the, the value of constancy. So you spoke a lot about how constancy uh, elevates one above sort of worldly struggle. Um, I was wondering if that's the only benefit or even the primary benefit or if there's um, any role in how constancy allows us to better access reason or better use our reason? Uh, do you think that that, where do you think reason plays in or do you think there's any end maybe other than reason in this constancy or is it just being able to rise above? So if I, if I correctly understand Seneca's formulation of it, the wise man, which I mean there you see reason, he's talking about the wise person the whole time. So there seems to be an element of like being able to recognize the truth about something so the person who has complete reason also has virtue. And so when you put the two together, you get constancy because not necessarily as the end, but for the purpose of this essay, it kind of is. Um, and so I do think that because the wise man is unhindered by fortune and not worried about what he can lose. So he is like rising above worldly issues because he most prizes his reason and virtue and nothing can take that away. And because those are his, those are his identity, then you can't have constancy without reason. And as far as like what good constancy is, I do think that it does enable you to act rightly because you're not just acting in response to someone else's opinion or someone else's injury. Um, it allows you to be more proactive because you're deciding how you ought to act and just acting accordingly. Yeah. Um, I had a question about something you spoke on pretty early on um, with Stilpo and his daughters, right? Um, I was wondering if in any of your readings it touched on the fact that like, you know, like children are kind of an extension of their mother and father. And so um, when Stopo says that he, um, all of his assets are fine because like he has all of himself, does, did I, any of your readings ever touch on the fact of like how children are connected to their mother and father in a sense? That's something that Seneca does not care to address as far as I recall. Um, and I know that assets, like the passage I quoted as far as like his daughters are probably not included in assets, but he does say, whatever I had, I have and hold. So I think that points to like his daughters were included in what he had and he doesn't have them anymore. He says he has no clue where they are and he doesn't care. And so to me, Seneca doesn't seem concerned with family relations. Yeah. Can I ask another? Uh, did you, you also um, spoke of Stilpo as a caricature. Uh, mm -hmm. Why did you use that word? And, and in addition, is there something in this model as is, is Stilpo a model, uh, a model that's a peak, something to look to, so it doesn't change, it doesn't move, and therefore it's, it's obviously sort of, it's just 
patently obvious that the, the, the constancy is in the model, which doesn't change, that we are to aim towards or look to as we strive to overcome insult and injury and all of the passions that may issue from us. And then secondly, just how does Cato fit with all of this too? Well, Cato does fit with all of this, and he fits in the sense that St Seneca explicitly states that Cato, who I did not bring up in this talk because he complicates things, um, <laughs> Cato is perhaps surpassing the model of the wise man. I don't quite know what that means. I've thought about it a lot. But um, I, don't, I do think Stilpo is a caricature in the sense that Seneca is recording what he, he puts words in Stilpo's mouth. He says, this is what Stilpo says. And then he proceeds to tell the whole story. And so there, it's not like an interview with Stilpo. And so Seneca is framing things the way that he wants them to be seen. One thing, as far as like a specific example between Stilpo and Cato, where Cato is supposed to be so far, he's supposed to surpass beyond like Ulysses, um, the wise man. And Cato takes his life after C Caesar wins the civil war in Rome. And apparently it would have been an unthinkable offense for Cato to continue living after Rome had died. And so that was an act that Seneca points to in his discussion of the wise man, which is entirely counter to how Stilpo reacts to the conquest of his city. So all that to say, I'm skeptical of Stilpo being the model for which we ought to strive. And I think that's also demonstrated by the fact that after spending so much time talking about this person who seems rather inhuman as far as his connections to p other people and to his city and to his family. Um, he then turns from that to spend the rest of the essay talking about how to deal with it when you get injured and you get insulted. And so Seneca uses Stilpo as a, look, this, I'm not, it, it almost could come across as like, I'm not asking you to do this, but like, look at this, which could be possible, maybe in theory, and see the benefits of it because there are benefits and learn from that and apply it to a more everyday realm. Yes, um, I'm Adam Thomas and uh, I have a, I guess my question is, uh, I kind of want to, I want to understand what the kind of view of virtue and happiness is in Stilpo and or Seneca and whether you agree with it or not. My understanding from your talk is that the view of virtue that Stilpo must have is one, that virtue is sufficient for happiness. So you don't need external goods at all to be happy. He just he doesn't lose anything, he's the same as he was before, uh, because he still has his virtue. <coughs> um, the second thing that seems to be involved is the idea that virtue must be something that doesn't require any goods of fortune to actualize. Mm -hmm. You always have your mind with you, or whatever it is inside of you that's sort of cordoned off your will, and therefore you're always able to be virtuous, and therefore happy. Um, both those things seem questionable to me. Um, but is that actually what you think is going on? Are those kind of views of Seneca and or Stilpo? And to what degree do you um, agree with them? For simplicity's sake, I'm going to lump Seneca and Stilpo together, because there's not really a way to honestly separate them. Um, Seneca. See, it seems that he is convinced, or at least he presents it as, when you have virtue and you, like fortune can't take that. So that's the key to this whole thing, is fortune can't take your virtue, so whatever happens to you, you won't lose the thing that is most valuable. So therefore, you as a person will be untouched by those insults and injuries. To me, that doesn't sound like happiness. Um, and I don't even know that Stilpo sounds happy. He just sounds, I mean, he sounds fine. He's like continuing on with his life and he's you know, happy to report that he'll be, you know, he'll be untouched by the conquest of his enemies even though he underwent lot, allegedly you know, like he, losing everything. Um, humiliation, interrogation, his family's gone. But he doesn't sound joyous and fully experiencing the heights of human existence. So I don't think I agree with that formulation of happiness as like 
human flourishing. But I do think that I, I agree with the aspect of constancy that emphasizes that you can't, that who you are as a person is not dictated by your circumstances in the sense that you can, that you have agency to respond to those circumstances. Now, circumstances are going to form you and you can't like go back and figure out like what would I do if I'd grown up in the woods or whatever. But I do think it is important in the midst of my skepticism of constancy being sufficient for humanity, it's important to remember that life is full of fortune. And by fortune, Seneca is just referring to circumstances that are outside of your control. And so we are necessarily dealing with that from a day-to-day -day basis. And I do think that it is a helpful framework to understand a clear dividing line between my response to something and what is done to me. So you may be aware that Stoicism, Seneca in particular, uh, has had something of an unexpected popularity. Uh, and I just wondered, from your study, uh, would you consider this, if this were a more widespread phenomenon, would this be a good thing today or, or not, and, and why? Well, I'm unfamiliar with the contemporary developments in Stoicism, but I do think, like, like I was emphasizing just now in my answer to Dr. Thomas, I think it's very valuable to recognize that it is our responsibility how we react to something and that our circumstances do not dictate our actions. We're not just being thrown around and we are culpable for our actions. Um, so in that sense, I do think that stoicism would be helpful rather than I, I can't help it, life is hard, like we're just gonna curl up in the corner. Um, I don't think that's a good reaction. And I do think that people need to be more rational. They need to recognize that they get to choose to maintain their virtue. They get to choose how to live. And so in that sense, I do think it could be beneficial. Yes. So as as you kind of continue to push through this, um, and we've gone and and you've kind of laid out this, there seems to be some practical applications for this this constant person, and like coming back to still being this character, but then like we have these dealing with insults and injuries. But also, if I like remember correctly, there seems to be a part of Seneca that makes this whole constant person like like all or nothing in the sense of like you're either going to completely overcome fortune, or fortune will beat you. So how do you qualify this whole like? Well, maybe this constantly can be used in moderation. There can be appropriate reactions. And like, you don't have to go to the extreme of Cato or Stilpo, mm -hmm. but also at the same time, it seems like Seneca would still be like, well, no, you're still just going to lose to fortune in the end. So uh, how, how does that work? I think that hits upon one of my biggest frustrations because it, it's like the wise man is impenetrable. He's surrounded by these walls of virtue. But then he spends time talking about having dinner with your political enemies and all the stuff they say to you. And so I do think, I'd, perhaps I'd, Seneca's formulation of constancy might not be attainable. I don't know that it's necessarily desirable either. Um, but Seneca himself seems to be a little inconsistent in how he goes about it. And he seems to think that there is something valuable to be learned from it. Um, he talks, you know, his striving for the heights and it's going to be difficult but you can't you know you're not going to reach the heights by a flat path and so he does seem concerned that people who are skeptical and maybe not necessarily cut out for this should listen and learn from it and so in that sense Seneca is aware of the fact that he's asking for a lot but he that doesn't stop him from like saying that and then bringing up Stilpo so doesn't really answer your question. But. <laughs> yes? This may be a little bit off topic, but the story of Silpo kind of reminds me about Job in the Bible, who basically lost everything he owned in a similar way, but never stopped being, 
uh, happy might not be the right word, but you know, he's, he's never angry. He's content with the situation. And in the case of Job, I think he doesn't necessarily have this constancy from reason. He isn't you know, reasoning out this. He's just kind of, he remains grateful to God out of some kind of love or, or something a bit more emotional. What do you think Seneca would say about this version of constancy? I do think that Job is a good example of something that's not Seneca. It's a different formulation, as you pointed out, um, but a way that similar characteristics could show up um, in, for that example, like in the realm of faith. As far as guessing what Seneca would say about Job, I could not venture. It's hard to know what Seneca says about the things he says, so <laughs> I may just have to leave it at that. <laughs> But have you done any more thinking on this in terms of this view of fortune? Because I know you've studied a little bit of Machiavelli as well. And have, have you done any thinking on, on this way of dealing with the slings and arrows of for, fortune, the way that Seneca tries to find constancy by retreat into one's own virtue and, and overcoming passions, as opposed to Machiavelli's way of dealing with fortune by who favors the impetuous? It's the, it's the antithesis of constancy by, by the risk-taking, impetuous youth of whom Machiavelli speaks in Prince 25. It does seem like approaching things with Machiavelli's perspective is kind of the exact opposite of Seneca because that's still, de that's still dependent on your circumstances. And so in that sense, Seneca's approach seems safer because you have more control over it. But that also may be because I'm not a very impetuous person. So I can like align more with the idea of thinking through things and considering like where I am and what responsibilities and options I have for reacting. And so in that sense, I've thought a lot more about Seneca and I also might think more similarly to Seneca about this. Yes. C.B. Thompson. Um, so pain and suffering and trials and tribulations are a part of life, but they are not the norm of life. So my, I guess my question is, from Seneca's perspective, is there a way of life better than still woes? Seneca? And what would it be? Um, another thing we read along with on the constancy of the wise person was on leisure, which is talking about, and that seems much more of Seneca's view of human flourishing and life as it should be. So my memory is a little atrocious, so I'm not gonna try and recall what on leisure said, but I think that that would be a place to look to see what Seneca views as good and to just recognize that this essay is dealing primarily with hardship and suffering. I'll give it a go. Uh, <laughs> can you respond to Nietzsche's attack on Stoicism, saying that uh, it's, a, it's a design to live according to the nature, and if the stoical living, uh, taking every setback is natural living, and then Nietzsche responds by saying, what kind of nature is, is, are the Stoics referring to? Very strange version, because the nature that we experience is wild, random, crazy, violent, indifferent, random, uh, all the crazy stuff that, uh, wasteful, and all the rest of it. So then you have two different uh, interpretations of what the natural order is. Uh, Informing one attitude of constancy, one informs the attitude of constancy and stoicism, but from a Nietzschean point of view, order of the world, disorder of the world, this is most uh, perverse, this is most unnatural, this is most inhuman to be, to be natural in the way that uh, a stoic would live would be actually to be in violation of what we what we learn from there, or how we experience the natural world. Is, is there a way that you would confront that issue? 
I think that one thing, because I do find aspects of the Stoic view seemingly counter to human nature, particularly in the way that it undermines loyalty to life, family, and country, the way that it seems to leave no place for love, because love would be even more emotionally attaching than loyalty. And so in that sense, I, I would agree that this is somewhat unnatural. But I do think it's interesting that both Nietzsche and Seneca, from how you're describing Nietzsche's view, are very aware that nature is chaotic, that fortune does bring all sorts of unpredictability. And so Seneca is trying to find refuge in himself as far as a way of dealing with that. Um, I think there has to be a balance. I don't think imitating the chaos and um, turmoil of nature is going to lead to a helpful approach to dealing with it, because I don't think you should just buy all into that and then hope that you discover your true nature there, um, just responding in kind to however you, whatever you receive from fortune or others. And so I'm not sure what Nietzsche's solution would be for as far as dealing with the chaos of nature if he would say that you should go fully for it. But I do think that Seneca is showing only a part of human nature, at least in on constancy. Yeah, that makes sense because Nietzsche's solution, in a way, of as hostile as he is to stoicism, is amor fati. You know, you do have a faith, and you must love it as your own faith, and that's the only attitude that, that you, you need to adopt. And there's a way in which amor fati is a bit like a stoical disposition mm -hmm. to the world you find yourself in. So there's a kind of a divergence and a convergence somehow out there with both. Yeah. That makes sense. All right, well, that's all the time that we have for today. Please join me in thanking Ms. Bloom for this fantastic talk. <laughs>